Hello, Anatomy students. We're going to kick off our discussion on the skeletal system by talking about bone tissue. These are the objectives for you to know. Um, number one, list and describe the functions of the skeletal system. Number two, label the parts of the long bone and describe the characteristics. Number three, contrast the microscopic structure of compact and spongy bone. And then number four, Describe the distribution of various arteries and veins that serve osteocytes within the bones. Let's start by talking about the functions of bones. There are six functions that bones will perform in our bodies. The first three, I think, are pretty obvious, protection, movement, and support. Uh, the bones are going to protect our vital organs. For example, the skull, which is a bony structure, is going to protect our brain. Uh, our bones are going to help with movement because they are the attachment point for tendons which connect muscle to bone. So when the muscles contract, the bones move and um, our bodies are able to move in various ways. And then finally, support. Uh, the bones are going to support various tissues of our bodies and give our bodies form. Without our skeletal system, we would just be squishing around like slugs. Um, but instead, we, we have form to our bodies. We have a shape and that's all due to our skeletal system. But that's just the first three functions that our skeletal system is going to perform. Uh, the other three functions may not be so obvious to you. For instance, our bones um, are a storage place for calcium and phosphorus, and when stimulated, they will release these minerals into the bloodstream, so they will contribute to our body's homeostatic state. Our bones also perform hemopoiesis, which is the formation of red blood cells. This is happening in the bone marrow. Now, in fetuses and in children, all of their bones contain red bone marrow, but in adults, red bone marrow is going to be found only in certain places, some of which I've got circled for you on this diagram, like in flat bones of the sternum and of the pelvis, uh, which is right here, uh, and then the sternum is the breastbone up here. Uh, in the middle of the vertebrae, and then also in the ends of long bones, which is what we're going to talk about um, at length in just a little bit. Um, but uh, I just wanted to also mention, though, that um, white blood cells are also born in the bone marrow. Some white blood cells stay in the bone marrow and mature there. Some white blood cells are going to move on to other tissues of the body and mature there. Uh, in adults, though, um, the middles of long bones are going to contain yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is yellow because it contains fat or triglycerides, and that fat can be tapped by our body as an energy source should we need it. So um, our bones also act as an energy reserve. And so those are the six functions of our skeletal system. So now let's move on and talk about the structure of long bones. Later on, we're going to talk about the uh, shapes of bones, of other bones that comprise our skeleton, but here we're only going to focus on long bones. Um, these are characterized as being longer than they are wide, and uh, they include our femur, which is our thigh bone, the humerus, which is the bone of the upper arm, um, even our finger bones. Um, are considered long bones. So even though they're tiny, they still have the same structures that these long bones have. Okay, so um, each long bone is going to have two ends. The ends of these bones are called the epiphyses or an epiphysis uh, singular. Uh, the proximal epiphysis is the end that is closest to the attachment of the trunk. So the epiphysis of the humerus, or the proximal epiphysis of the humerus, is the part that is closest to the shoulder. Well, the distal epiphysis is the part that's closer to the elbow, the part that's further away from the trunk of the body. Uh, the long, narrow portion that's found in the middle of the long bone is called the diaphysis. And that's this word that we have uh, right here, whoops, sorry, that we have there. Uh, oh gosh, I did it again. <laughs> and the diaphysis is connected to the epiphyses at each end by a metaphysis. And so for you etymology folks out there, the root physis or physis means to grow. Uh, dia means through, and so the word diaphysis means growing through. 
the prefix epi, you should remember from our first unit when we studied the nine abdominal pelvic regions, the epigastric region was upon the stomach. And uh, here, this means uh, the epiphysis means upon the growing. And that's going to make a little bit more sense in just a little bit. And then meta means middle or in between. And so the metaphysis is between the diaphysis and the epiphysis on each side of the diaphysis. All right, in between each, uh, e each epiphysis and metaphysis, we have a line of hyaline cartilage. And this is called the epiphyseal plate when the individual is growing. And it's called the epiphyseal line which once growing has stopped. So again, the epiphyseal plate is made of hyaline cartilage, and what happens is that the chondrocytes are going to migrate toward the, uh, towards the diaphysis side of our epiphyseal plate, and then those cells are going to die and the cartilage matrix is going to ossify. And as that happens, the diaphysis gets longer and the epiphysis gets further and further away from the middle of the diaphysis. And so that's why the epiphysis means upon growing because the, the epiphysis is on top and the growth is happening below it. And the growth pushes that epiphysis further and further away from the center of our bone. Now, once growing stops, that entire line of hyaline cartilage is going to become bone. It's going to ossify, and then the name changes to the epiphyseal line. And we'll talk more about that in um, greater detail a little bit later on. At the ends of the bones, like I said, you have the epiphyses, and each epiphysis is covered by hyaline cartilage. Um, but since this is the ends of the bones, and this is where one bone is going to meet with another bone, it's going to form what's called an articulation or a joint, they call that articular cartilage. Now this articular cartilage is very strong. It's got this very smooth, glassy, blue-white appearance. And uh, it's going to be very tough, so it's going to reduce friction in between the bones as they move against each other. Now, because there is no um, blood supply going to this hyaline cartilage, it uh, going directly to the hyaline cartilage, I should say, um, it's very difficult to repair should it become injured. The outside of the bones, except for the area that has the articular cartilage on it, is covered by a fibrous connective tissue called the periosteum. And the periosteum is going to not only protect the bone, but it's also going to support blood vessels and nerves that are entering into the bone itself. So it's going to play a role in the nourishment and in the repair of fractures. Um, and it's also continuous with ligaments and with tendons. And so sometimes um, if you have a very severe injury, if um, you tear a tendon, sometimes you can even rip off a part of that periosteum. And that is extremely painful because the periosteum has a very rich nerve supply. Now the inside of the periosteum, the inner layer, is going to contain osteogenic cells. Um, these are cells that are going to create bony matrix. These are, these are cells that are not going to be involved so much in the lengthening of the bone, but more in something called appositional growth or in the widening of the bone. And that should make sense because the periosteum is found on the sides of the bone, and so those cells are going to build up that bony matrix and make the bone wider. The periosteum is connected to the bone that it covers by collagenous fibers that are called Sharpies fibers. All right, uh, two more structures of long bone for you to know. 
Uh, the first is the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is a hollowed out space that's found inside the diaphysis of long bones. And thank goodness for this, because if we were just told, like if our bones were solid, it would be very difficult for us to move. We would look very different than we do today. We'd have to have much larger muscles in order to move all of this solid, solid bone around. So the medullary cavity is a hollowed out space. It's going to contain uh, blood vessels and bone marrow. And again, in adults, that bone marrow is yellow bone marrow because it contains triglycerides or fat. And in uh, kids and in fetuses, it's going to have red bone marrow. The walls of the medullary cavity are lined by a thin membrane called the end ostium. And this membrane contains uh, stem cells called osteoprogenitor cells that are going to differentiate to form bone cells, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, this membrane is made mostly of connective tissue. All right, so let's start talking about uh, bone tissue in greater detail. So this section is called the histology of bone tissue. So what exactly is bone tissue anyway? Well, bone is a connective tissue. It's the only solid connective tissue that we have in our bodies. And what are all connective tissues made out of? They are made out of uh, cells and extracellular matrix. And what's extracellular matrix made out of? It's made out of protein fibers and uh, ground substance. So the protein fiber that is found inside of our bone is collagen. And collagen is going to give bone a little bit of flexibility. So that's why you can swing on a swing and jump off and land on the ground and live to tell the tale because you do have a little bit of flexibility in your bones. If you didn't have that collagen, then your bones would shatter all the time. Um, so uh, the, the matrix that, or uh, the ground substance that's surrounding this, um, these collagen fibers uh, is made up of water and also of crystallized mineral salts. And these crystallized mineral salts uh, are largely made of something called hydroxyapatite. So here, if, uh, if you remember from chemistry, you have calcium phosphate, and that's going to combine with calcium hydroxide, and we get a large molecule called hydroxyapatite. Uh, and that's the main salt that is found inside of our bone matrix. And our, these salts are deposited in between the collagen. So the salts are going to accumulate around the collagen fibers, and that is what is going to cause this hard tissue to form. The process of this, like of these salts uh, crystallizing and kind of accumulating around these collagen fibers is called calcification. So the hardness of the bone is due to the crystallized salts that are found inside of the matrix, and the flexibility of bone is due to the collagen that is found inside of this bony matrix. So what's making this bony matrix? What is making our bones for us? It's these different cells that are going to be responsible for both synthesizing and maintaining our bones. And so we're going to talk about each of these four different types of bone cells um, individually. Our first type of cell that I wanted to talk about is called the osteoprogenitor cell. This is a bone stem cell. You're going to find osteoprogenitor cells in the inner lining of the periosteum, but also in the endosteum, which is the membrane that lines the medullary cavity of long bones. Now, it should be no surprise that these are derived from mesenchyme. I mean, bone is a connective tissue, and all connective tissue comes from the embryonic connective tissue called mesenchyme. So these osteoprogenitor cells are going to come from this embryonic uh, connective tissue. These osteoprogenitor cells 
are kind of like the cells of the stratum basale. These are the only cells that are going to divide in the bone, just like the cells of the stratum basale are the only cells to divide in the epidermis. So the daughter cells are going to become osteoblasts. So when a, an osteoprogenitor cell divides, we have two daughter cells. One of them is going to stick around in the endosteum or in the inner lining of the periosteum in order to continue to divide and make more cells as needed, while the other one is going to move on to develop into another kind of cell called an osteoblast. You will also find osteoprogenitor cells in canals that are found inside of the bone that contain uh, blood vessels. And these are called canaliculi, so we'll talk about those in a little bit. Okay, so osteoprogenitor cells are going to become osteoblasts. And osteoblasts build bone. So blasts build, BB. That's what you've got to remember here. So these osteoblasts are going to synthesize um, and secrete the monomers in order to create the collagen. So as I said before, the collagen forms the framework for the bony matrix, and then the salts are going to crystallize around them. And so the osteoblasts are making that collagen. Um, they are also going to initiate uh, calcification. So you, you can't have calcification if you don't have the collagen, I guess is my point. Now the interesting thing about osteoblasts is that once they reach an area, they secrete their collagen uh, matrix, and once that collagen gets uh, calcified, they have now trapped themselves in their own secretion. And once that happens, they are no longer called osteoblasts. Their name, it, their name is going to change into osteocytes. And so this picture here is a nice, plump osteoblast that uh, has become trapped in its own matrix. And so the osteoblasts then become mature osteocytes. These are mature bone cells. And you can see a difference here. Like It looks a little bit spinier. It's a little bit thinner. The osteocytes are mature bone cells. And their job is to maintain and monitor the tissue. So they are going to exchange or take out oxygen and nutrients like calcium from the blood uh, in order to help maintain the bone. Uh, and then their waste products are going to go back into the blood where it's going to be taken away. So the, the osteocytes do have a blood supply so that you can have the exchange of materials there. So we've got one other type of cell to talk about, and these are osteoclasts. So they are going to do the opposite of what osteoblasts do. So remember BB, blasts build. Well, osteoclasts are the sculptors. These are the artists of the bone, of the skeletal system. They are going to break the bone down. They are going to shape the bone and sculpt it, especially if bone has been injured. Because remember, function uh, is only going, the right functions the right are going to be carried out only if the form of the structure is correct. And so it's very important that our bones maintain their uh, general structure so that they can serve our body properly. So osteoclasts do not come from osteoprogenitor cells. Um, they are going to come from a line of white blood cells. And a number of these white blood cells called monocytes are going to fuse together in order to form these big uh, bone cells called osteoclasts. And they have a very interesting shape. They have something that's called a ruffled border or an uneven cell membrane. And from the cell membrane, you it's going to secrete acids and enzymes that are going to tear down the bone. And so as they tear down the bone, they're shaping it. But what they're also doing is they're releasing the minerals from the bony matrix into the blood. So if there's ever a condition that somebody has where they have low blood calcium, for instance, then our um, osteoclasts are going to be stimulated by uh, various hormones, mainly uh, PTH or a parathyroid hormone. Uh, they're going to be stimulated by this hormone into action in order to start breaking down the bone 
to release calcium into the blood in order to bring that calcium level back up to its normal level. So it's going to help, uh, these cells are going to help maintain homeostasis in that way. And so those are the cells of our bone tissue. Let's take a look now at two different kinds of bone that we have. We have compact bone and we have spongy bone. Compact bone is the stronger of the two types. It looks solid. And so if you take a look at the picture that I have here for you, this line of bone that's on the outside, that is compact bone and it appears to be solid. Although it is riddled with tiny holes and tiny capillaries, or tiny canals, excuse me, um, albeit not quite as many as um, the spongy bone is. So our compact bone um, is the stronger form. It's deep to the periosteum, and it's going to make up the bulk of long bones. So that's where the weight of long bones is really coming from, is from the the, the compact bone that lies underneath the periosteum. Uh, so this compact bone is going to serve as protection for the spongy bone uh, and the marrow that lies beneath. It's going to provide support for bones. Um, and it's going to resist stress from weight and from movement. Now, uh, the functional unit of compact bone um, or excuse me, I should say the structural unit of compact bone is called the osteon. And so osteons, I just like to think of them as like those little like four nubbed um, Legos, like there's they're in a square of four, and they just kind of stack one on top of the other. They are arranged parallel to the medullary cavity of the long bone. Now, uh, osteons um, are made up of this um, bony matrix. Uh, and they are, the bony matrix of compact bone is uh, formed in rings, kind of like a bullseye. And these rings are called the concentric lamellae, which is right here. So the concentric lamella are just rings of bone that form like a bullseye around a central canal. That central canal is called the osteonic canal, which you can see here in the picture. So the osteonic canal is going to be found in the middle of these rings of bony matrix uh, called the concentric lamellae. So, and I just said lamella in three different pronunciations. It should be, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, it should be la, uh, lamellae is how you say that word, lamellae. So A-E is going to have uh, the, the A, long A ending, excuse me for that. Now in your book, uh, they use a different name for osteonic canals. Your book uses the term haversion canal and they are used interchangeably. Okay, so um, inside of the concentric lamella, lamellae, you have these tiny little holes that are called lacunae. Lacunae are tiny holes and they are the homes of osteocytes. And remember, those are the mature bone cells that we just talked about a couple slides ago. So the osteocytes are tiny cells and they live inside of these holes called lacunae. Now, osteocytes uh, don't live independently of one another. They have to communicate with each other. And the way that they are able to do that is through tiny little canals that are called canaliculi. The canaliculi um, are going to allow for the exchange of ions from one osteocyte to another. So these osteocytes are going to contain gap junctions so that these ions can move through their cell membranes very, very quickly and easily. But the canaliculi are also going to contain tiny capillaries. So this is how oxygen and nutrients are going to run from our haversion canals or uh, from our osteonic canals 
to our osteocytes. Also, I mentioned before that our osteoprogenitor cells are going to be found in tiny canals that contain blood vessels. That's the canaliculi too. So we're also going to have some osteoprogenitor cells that are found inside of the canaliculi as well. So remember that just like all cells, our osteocytes need oxygen and nutrients to be delivered to them, but they need their waste products to be removed. So that's always a, a big thing that I think students forget is, is that removal of the waste products. Okay, so we know that we have blood vessels that are um, moving through the centers of these osteons, but how did they get there? Well, I've mentioned before that the periosteum supports blood vessels as they enter the bone. And that's what we see here by the number one in our diagram. We have uh, red for arteries and blue is for veins. And these blood vessels are piercing through that periosteum. And as they pierce through the periosteum, they are entering the bony matrix through a tunnel that runs perpendicular to the medullary cavity of the long bone. This tunnel is called the interosteonic canal. So inter means between, osteon means osteon, and then IC means pertaining to. So interosteonic canal pertains to between the osteons, for you etymology folks out there. So uh, here's our blood vessels again. So our blood vessels are running along the outside of the periosteum. It pierces the periosteum. It goes through the interosteonic canal. And then that's where it meets up with the blood vessels that are found in the osteonic canals. And then from there, they become tinier and tinier. And you have little tributaries that enter the canaliculi and that travel to the lacunae that will then serve our osteocytes that are found within the lacunae. So that's all that I've got then for our compact bone. So compact bone is uh, made up of these structural units that are called osteons. And the terms to remember for the osteon are concentric lamellae, the uh, lacuna, that contain the osteocytes, canaliculi that connect the lacunae to each other and thus the osteocytes to each other. You have the central canal, also known as the haversian canal, also known as the osteonic canal. And you also have the interosteonic canal. So uh, one other mention about the interosteonic canal is that your book calls them the Volkmann's canals. And again, just like Haversian canal means osteonic canal, Volkmann's canals also refer to the interosteonic canals. Okay, so let's move on now to our spongy bone. Spongy bone is a little bit different from our compact bone because it looks spongy. It has a lot of uh, various spaces that are surrounded by arches of uh, bone. These arches of bone actually have a name. They are called trabeculae. Now, within the arches, we have concentric lamellae, we have osteocytes, um, we have uh, various kinds of, of, of bone cells like osteoblasts and osteoclasts. But even though our trabeculae have all of these different things, they are not arranged like osteons. So osteons are only found in compact bone. They are not found in spongy bone. Another important feature of our spongy bone is that uh, it contains bone marrow. So it, within the spongy bone, you will have bone marrow filling in those tiny little spaces. Oh, and then one last thing I wanted to mention since it's here on our picture is that spongy bone lines the medullary cavity. And so if we take a look at our 
um, at our uh, picture here, um, you can see that we've got uh, our, whoops, sorry. You can see that we have, I did it again, uh, our periosteum all the way over um, on the outside. And then here's an osteon. This is all compact bone here. But then you can see that it changes to spongy bone. And then we would have the medullary cavity um, on the outside of that. And then in this picture here, I just wanted you to see that even though we've got a lot of the same structures that are found in compact bone, spongy bone is not arranged in osteons. All right. Uh, so the locations of spongy bone. Uh, they are found in the epiphyses of long bones and also in the medullary cavities of long bones. But then in other uh, shaped bones that we have in our bodies, the spongy bone is found on the inside and it's surrounded by compact bone on the outside. And so wherever bone isn't uh, heavily stressed, that's where you're going to have your spongy bone. The, the compact bone is the type of bone that can handle stress. So that's why you've got the, because you've got the periosteum on the outside of it, and then the periosteum is connected to tendons. I mean, when muscles contract and the tendons pull on the bone, that's stress. So we need that compact bone on the outside to ensure that our bones don't break underneath the stress um, that's put upon it by our muscles. All right, this next slide is showing us um, some comparisons between spongy bone and compact bone. So spongy bone is lighter. Um, it's going to allow us to have easier movement. If we were all compact bone, we would look very different. We would have a lot of muscle because we'd have to move all that compact bone around. Our spongy bone has trabeculate, which are the bony arches that create spaces in between, and those spaces are filled with red bone marrow. Uh, this is where hemopoiesis occurs in adults, and then these are the areas of our, uh, these are the different bones that are going to contain that spongy bone. Compact bone is heavier than spongy bone. Um, it's going to be found where stress is applied in, in, uh, in a few directions, and it's going to provide protection for spongy bone. The other thing that I want to make sure that you realize about compact bone is that it's made of osteons. So the osteon is the structural unit of compact bone. Osteons are not found in spongy bone. All right, so before we finish this up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the nerve and blood supply of bones. Our bones have a lot of cells and they need oxygen and nutrients uh, to be delivered to them and they need their waste products to be taken away. So our bones have a very rich blood supply. But the thing that I wanted to really hit home here is that different areas of bones have separate arteries and veins that serve them. And so the epiphysis of the bone or the ends of the bone, and, and in, in this picture here, we are looking at the tibia in particular. Um, and so uh, you can see here that the epiphysis or the top portion of the tibia is served separately than uh, the diaphysis of the tibia. The nerves are always going to accompany the blood vessels and the periosteum, as I said before, has a lot of nerve endings. So what that means is that our uh, periosteum uh, is, if it gets injured, it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt a lot because it does have quite a few nerve endings in it. And um, I really liked this picture because um, it just shows you that if you, t if you kind of pull away that periosteum, you can see that uh, we have blood vessels that pierce that periosteum, and then it goes into the compact bone. And, and remember that the name of that canal uh, is called the interosteonic canal because it's running perpendicular to the medullary cavity, and then they, they merge with the blood vessels that are found in the osteonic canals, and those are the ones that run parallel to the uh, medullary cavity of long bones. 
And then once again, just kind of hitting home that uh, the epiphyses of the lung bones are going to have a separate uh, blood supply. All right, let's see what you guys remember. So how does red bone marrow contribute to the function of the skeletal system? I'm going to count, give you a three count, and then I'll tell you the answer. Your answer? By performing hemopoiesis. So there, it's going to um, create red blood cells. Number two, which feature of long bone structure is a tough connective tissue sheath that surrounds the bone surface and is associated with the blood supply that supports the bone? So the key words here are tough connective tissue sheath. Well, if you said periosteum, then you are correct. Next, where would you find uh, osteons in compact bone or in spongy bone? Hopefully you said compact bone. You will not find osteons in spongy bone. And our last question, how do periosteal arteries enter the diaphysis? So my question is, basically, what canal do arteries and veins use to enter the bony matrix? Well, this is the canal that is going to run perpendicular to the medullary cavity. So you could have given me one of two answers, either interosteonic canal or Volkmann's canal. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you learned a lot. Uh, I know there's a lot of vocabulary in here, so um, hopefully uh, you've taken some good notes uh, or you have uh, filled out your optional note sheet as I've talked. I will see you in class. Bye for now.